Okay, we're back. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's keep going with what we're doing today, all right? So we talked about validation so far, and that's great. And um, in the process, we introduced this word called rule. <laughs> so a rule here was simply some kind of, it's in, in a sense, it's a kind of policy that we have. But the rule, the word rule simply says that uh, there's a specification that we have to meet, okay? And this was for validating forms, uh, inputs coming in from users. Let's talk about r other types of rules. In particular, I want to talk about formal policies, okay? And, um, and, I'm, and I want to talk about security policies, but let's talk about what policies are in the first place and why, there's, why it's such an important thing that I need to have a you know, whole lecture about policies in this class. So as most of you know that most organizations have something, some kind of policy document. They have many types of policy documents. So generally, policy documents are a list of rules and regulations that a company uses when it's dealing with maybe it's employees. There's, maybe there's a policy document on employees. There might be a policy document for customers. There might be a policy document for other partners. And it basically says how the organization should interact with employees or customers or other partners when it's doing certain transactions or doing certain types of processes like um, handling human relations or employment issues, how it when it's handling sales and other things, okay? And if you go online, you can actually find some, a lot of examples of real policy documents all over the internet. Uh, for example, here is a policy document from Queen's University. And um, this is a research administration policy document. And uh, there's a few key things in here that I'd like you to kind of take a look at because these are some words we're gonna use when we talk about security policies. One thing is um, policy documents usually tell you what is, what is this policy for? Like what's this policy all about? And um, within this uh, policy document, they tell you that the purpose of this policy is to outline the responsibility and authority for managing and administrating research activity at Queen's University. So it's gonna have something to do about what are the rules and regulations for research at this university, all right? Um, all right, and managing the research and administration of, uh, managing the administration of research at a university. So that's what this policy is about. Scope is about what is this policy affect? So scope of a policy usually tells you this relates to like the university staff, the faculty, the equipment, this, that, the other things, okay? So it'll tell you what are the things that are, that are covered by this policy, right? And then last of all, there'll be a whole bunch of policy statements. And these are gonna be the rules and regulations of the policy. So for an example, let's look at this one. Let me see if I can zoom in so you can read it a little bit more clearly. Um, Payments to support research activity must be made payable to the university and not to the individual researcher. So perhaps research grants and things should not go directly to a professor because then the professor can just you know eat it up and do whatever they want. The money has to go through the university. All right. So there are these are the rules and regulations for research at uh, management at this at Queen's University, for example. And this is an example of a policy document. All right. Policies are an interesting and complicated thing. And my other class on service centered architecture, we spend most of the semester talking about how to model policies in a way because we talk about business rules, all right? Um, this semester, this is the only time I'm really gonna talk about rules. But one of the things, if you, especially if, you're not, if you've not worked in an organizational environment before is that policies are, um, Policies are important because they, they actually tell you what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. But um, at the same time, policies can be hard to manage because sometimes policies can be very hard to find. Like if someone says, hey, uh, let's say in a university we're recruiting some students and we say, oh, we have a student from this background and this, are we allowed to recruit the student? We have to go find the policy document. And oftentimes we, like as a faculty, I don't even know where that is. I have to go call my department uh, administrator. She has to call the, college administrator, maybe she has to call the university administrator. Somebody maybe knows what the policy is, but it's not very clear where the document is. Policy documents, however, should be easy to find and e because you have to often refer to them to make sure you're doing things correctly. 
policy documents also have to be written in a way that is easy to read and easy to verify. It, it is kind of a legal document, but at the same time, it should be readable even to, not, to people who are not with a legal background because um, we cannot consult a lawyer every single time we are enacting a rule or a regulation. We have to also be able to read it and make sure we understand the spirit of it, okay? So policy documents are, are difficult to write because they have to be easy to read and easy to verify, all right? And they have to be easy to update as well because policies change. And this is the point I really wanna make. In most organizations, a lot of the thing that we call innovation, like you know, in schools we say, we should innovate, innovate. A lot of innovation is really about innovating on policies and about changing policies and rules, okay? Um, for example, one example of a policy innovation, in case you don't believe that you can innovate with policies potentially, uh, let's say is, well, just you know, this year, for example, the University of California, Berkeley, I think, but maybe the whole system, I think the whole University of California system, but at least Berkeley, um, has instituted a policy change that when students apply to the university, they do not have to provide a standardized exam score. They do not have to provide SAT scores anymore, for example, okay? This is a huge policy change because it completely changes how they're evaluating students uh, who are trying to enter the university system. And the reason they've changed it is because they have a lot of doubts about whether standardized tests really show them what is important for the university and what's important for the student. So that's an example of a policy innovation. And in our, if, you, if you're in an organization, policies change all the time because that's how we, that's one of the big ways in which we innovate. The other way, we, one of the other ways we innovate is through technology, we introduce new technologies. But other than introducing new technologies, we innovate a lot on changing our policies, okay? Um, and even if you have a new technology, you still have to change your policies to allow the technology to operate. For example, and I think this is a terrible idea, but for example, let's say a university says, we, when, student, when we are recruiting students, we're gonna use an AI system that's going to give every student a score based on their document and their background. We're gonna do like, it's gonna analyze all the documents and give it a score. I think that's a, that's a terrible idea, but let's say a university has this technology, it needs to change its policy and it needs to have a council or a committee that says, yes, we authorize this. So policy changes go, are often innovations by themselves, but oftentimes they also go hand in hand with technology innovations. So policies change all the time, okay? And uh, it's hard to write policies. So now imagine this, because we're gonna talk about security policies in a moment. We need to have, well, let's, let's talk about security policies, <laughs> okay? So, so let's talk about security policies. Uh, Security policies are also rules and regulations, and they outline rules and regulations about how subjects in a system can act upon objects in a system or with other subjects in a system. So for, and when I say subjects, I mean act, actors. Actors could be users and people. It could be other people other than users. It could be administrators as well. Those are also subjects like admins, right? Uh, system admins and stuff like that. Objects could be resources like files, folders, projects, repos, whatever your domain is, okay? Um, but policies also often tell you how subjects can interact with each other, okay? Like, so for example, on Facebook, um, can you just message anybody on Facebook or do you have to be their friend first? Um, so this has got to be a rule in the Facebook system somewhere, okay? Um, and uh, if you are a friend with somebody on Facebook, can you see everything that they have, all their pictures? Or are people allowed to limit what certain friends can see and what other people can see? These are all policies. And these are actually privacy policies on Facebook. So as you can imagine, um, web application, oh, not just web applications, any kind of application, especially user-facing applications, but any kind of application, will have tons of policies all over the system for every little thing, okay? Um, uh, uh, and, and some of these, are, and these are not just back-end things, a lot of them are front-end things as well. So, for example, um, if there's, a, let's use the Facebook example a little bit more. Let's say there's a Facebook group out there and I find this Facebook group and it's about, let's say, security and I go to um, join the group. <clears throat> um, there may be a join button that I can click to join the group. 
but it's also possible that the group is invitation only. All right, so you, you cannot join the group. You have to be invited by somebody in the group. Otherwise, you cannot join this group. In that case, should I show the join button or should I hide the join button? Because if I show the join button and they click it and we say, sorry, it's invitation only, then the user may feel like, well, then why did you give me a join button? <laughs> like <laughs> that button does nothing, right? So maybe then I should hide the button or disable the button. So the interface has also got to be aware of your policies, all right? So this is, uh, this is kind of a major issue. Let me show you an example, a simplified example of a policy in my system for this week, uh, for this semester, this Credence application I'm using where, us where users can create projects together and share sensitive documents in that project uh, with each other within a project, okay? So here might be some of the rules about projects. Um, for example, account holders, people with accounts on the system, can view or edit the details of documents, uh, excuse me, can view or edit the details of projects, and they can add or remove documents to projects, but only if they own the project or they collaborate on the project. So obviously you cannot go change a project you are not even a collaborator on. At the minimum you have to be a collaborator, but you should also, uh, but also if you own the project, you can like edit it, change it, add documents and remove documents and things like that. So that could be a policy rule in my system. And I have to make sure that people who come in and do, don't, don't follow this policy rule, I don't let them do things they're not supposed to do. How about deleting a whole project? Can you delete a whole project? What if there's collaborators on the project? Can anybody delete the project? Let's say I want my rule to be that account holders can only delete project if they own the project. So I don't want collaborators on a project to be able to delete a project because that, that would be you know terrible. <laughs> All right, I want the owner to have the ultimate authority to delete the project. Um, account holders can leave projects. So if I add you as a collaborator to a project, you are allowed to leave the project if you are a collaborator, okay? Meaning you don't, you don't want to collaborate on it anymore. Um, account holders can add or remove a collaborators to projects if they own the project. So if you're a collaborator on the project, my rule is going to be you are not allowed to invite other people to collaborate. Only the owner can add people to collaborate. Okay. I don't know what, what GitHub's rule is. Like on GitHub, do they allow, if you're a collaborator on a project on GitHub, are you allowed to add more collaborators or no? It might depend on the permission level you have as a collaborator as well okay so it gets very complicated as you can see right like all these rules get extremely complicated are you the owner of the project are you a collaborator on the project that's my system is simple on github if you're a collaborator there's like three different levels of collaborator there's like owner admin and something else i can't remember what it is so then each different level of permission gives you a different privilege so it gets extremely complicated okay um so and so these are all the rules and there's more rules but these are some of the examples of rules of the project, okay? I also have a rule that as an owner of a project, you cannot also be considered a collaborator. So I'm restricting the word collaborator, not to mean people who are collaborating, but to mean not the owner, but somebody who can work on a project. So, uh, so that's, the, that's my rule and my definition of collaborator in my rules, okay? So as you can see, these rules kind of look loosely like a legal document. This is like my written rules of the of projects, okay? So if somebody comes to me tomorrow and says, hey, sorry, there's something wrong with your system. Somebody who is not a collaborator was able to get into my system and change something. Then I have to ask two questions. One, is there, did my policy allow that? So then I have to go read a policy somewhere and maybe have a Word document or a Google document like what you're seeing on screen here where you can go look at it and say, mm, oh, that's not allowed, or hey, that's allowed, okay? So we may need a policy document that's written in plain language, in English, Chinese, whatever, so that users can read it as well. That we may need a policy document like that, okay? But there's another problem here, and I'll kind of get into this more in a moment. My policy document can't just be in English, it also has to be in my code, right? And that's gonna bring a whole bunch of other problems I'll talk about in a moment. So when we talk about security policies, these are the rules of security policies. In the world of security, we also talk about scope of policy, but it has a slightly different meaning sometimes. 
Um, scopes in technical policies, in programmatic policies, often refer to permissions. Not a, So you see all these rules are about one subject and one object, like an account holder and a document and a project. So given an account holder, a document, and a project, these three things, what are the rules between these three things? But scopes are permissions about a whole class of objects. So for example, when a user goes to see uh, a list of all their projects, which projects are they, uh, should we list? And so here a scope is about permission about a list of objects, in this case, a list of projects. And we can see that a user can see a list of projects, but those projects have to be projects they own or they collaborate on. Okay, This might be different from my normal rules. Like for example, it's possible if I make a project public, then everyone can see it's listed, but they can't click on it and see the details. Okay. So when you have a list of, uh, of objects, you often need a different rule than for a particular one object by itself. All right. So scopes tells me the permissions on, a, on lists of objects here. Okay. So, so this, is the, this is an example in, of my system, an example of a security policies. All right. And as you can see, it reads a little bit like you know, regular policy documents. It, I, I haven't written the purpose clearly yet. But it has, you know, certain rules. It has a, it has some scopes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, and so these are security policies. Any questions on security policies before I get into the technical stuff? Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the technical stuff now. Where should we write? our policies in our code, like where should they be, all right? Um, and this is, this is a problem. Uh, let me tell you the big reason for the problem. The big reason for the problem is that policies change a lot. Remember, this is one of the key ways in which organizations innovate is they change policies all the time, including security policies. So they have to be easy to find, easy to read, easy to verify, and easy to update, all right? So if someone comes to me and says, Somia, um, is it true that users can do X, Y, Z? Like, is it true that a user can see a project that they don't own? Well, I could go to the human document, but even if it's allowed here, how do I go verify it in the technical code itself? Where is my policy written in my code? And so the question comes, where should we write these policies? Like, where should we write the rules of the policy? Um, one option, is we can write it in our controllers. Like when somebody requests something, uh, like to click on this to, cl to see a data project. And let me go, let me actually go run my, uh, let me go run my, um, actually, hold on a second. Let me actually go run my code really quickly. Okay, rake. Rake run dev. All right, and um, let me go and see if Credence is up and awake. All right, so let's go to the homepage. Oh, uh, are you able to log in? What's going on? Oh, this hasn't even started. So slow today. My God, it's going to take forever. All right, so here's my page. I'm running it locally for now. Okay, and as you can see, I'm logged in and I can see my accounts. And uh, this week, I can also see a list of projects that I own. Okay, And so let me click on one of my projects, data project. And I'm the owner of this project, and I've got two collaborators on it. I've got Furen and Galit, and I can delete them as you know things. So who can see this project? Like if somebody uh, accesses this project, right? Um, where do I write the code to say who can see this project? Should I write this code in the, um, excuse me, sorry, hold on. Should I write this code in my controller? Like in the controller, should I say, oh, they want to open this page? Well, if the project owner is a current account or else the 
current account is in the list of collaborators, then go ahead and like show them. Should it be in the controller? That's my question. That's a question I have for you. Um, should it be in a model? Should I go to the account class or maybe the project class? I don't know which one, either the account class or the project model, and then add this method like uh, return the project only if like blah, 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 blah. Like where should I put this code? All right. Um, so let me just take a quick poll. How many of you think I should add the logic for which who can see this project in the controller? Any hands? All right. Oops, uh, I cannot see the anybody. Nobody, nobody, nobody. We have some comments coming in <laughs> in the model because the color is green. I love it. <laughs> you found my theme. You found my color theme here in this class. <laughs> so Tara says it should be in the model because I've campaign made it green and green is like success color in this class. Okay. And red is failure. Okay. Fine. Fine. Uh, let's see if you believe it. How many of you think it should be in the model? Okay. Great. So a lot of you believe it should go in the model. All right. Okay. Um, fantastic. Let me lower your hands. How many of you think you should go somewhere else? Not in the model, not in the controller. Oh, a couple of people. Interesting. Um, uh, let me pick on somebody. Billy, where do you think it should go? You can unmute yourself. Billy, <laughs> we've lost contact with Billy. Or else you can type it in the chat in the chat window if you wish, Billy. If you can't talk for some reason. Anybody else? Just type into the chat into the chat window. Anybody who's got a who feels it should go somewhere else, please just type it into the chat window where you think it should go. All right. By the way, we're gonna have the same problem with scopes. Like when when you go to see uh, not just this particular project, but when I go to see all my projects, which projects are listed here? This is a scope problem. Like when I want to see a listing of many projects, which projects am I allowed to see listed? All right. Um, is another problem. Should go in my controller. Should go in the model. All right. Someone says service object. All right, there is another place potentially. The service object could be another place. Okay, great. Thank you, Yanyu. All right, so there's a few options for where to go. But here's the issue though, folks. We could put it in the controller. Maybe not, not the best place to put it because the same rule could apply to multiple web pages. So if you put it in the controller, we'd have to duplicate the rule in multiple controllers. That's a danger because if I change the rule, I've got to go find all the controllers where I had this rule. How am I going to find all the controllers I had this rule? In a large system, I may have hundreds or thousands of controllers. Like, which ones? I don't know. Do I put a little comment with the keyword? Or like, how do I find them again? Maybe controllers is not the great idea. So nobody raised your hand. Very smart. Uh, a lot of you said models. Uh, no problem, Billy. Microphone problems, I understand. Um, what about the model? Model's not a bad idea. Model's not a bad idea. That's why it's green, Terra. Um, however, do I put it like I have, like, can this account see this project? Should I put it in the account model or should I put it in the project model? Hmm. Well, it's about accounts because which accounts can, which projects and accounts see, but it's also about projects. Like who can see this project? It's a little bit difficult, you know, like should it go to accounts, should it go to projects? What if it's a rule about like multiple objects and multiple subjects? Like it's about... It's a rule about accounts and uh, project and document. Like it's three different objects. Should it then, where should it go? All right. It becomes a little bit complicated about where it should go. So these kind of rules get complicated about where we should put rules. All right. Now I put a video online about rules. And what did the video say? Where's a good place to put rules? Anybody remember what the video said? Anybody? All right. 
So um, while I'm waiting for an answer from somebody, this problem gets even bigger when we have a distributed system, right? Um, we just talk, I was just talking about the web application and the browser. What about the API? Should we run the policies in the API or the web application? Hmm. This is a tough one. Should I write it in the API or the web application? Tara, they're both green, so I don't know what to do now. Um, how many of you think it should go in the, uh, let's say the API? How many of you think it should go in the API? Raise your hand. The rule should go in the API. No hands? Okay, one hand, thank you. A couple of hands. That's it. Okay. Three, two, three, two, three, three, three people. Four, five. Okay, it's getting, it's getting popular. Excellent. Okay. All right. And let me let me lower your hands really quickly. How many of you think it should go in the web application? Nobody. Oh, again, you asked me which video. Did I not send a video? Oops. Uh, maybe I didn't send a video. Maybe that's maybe that's next week's reading. Yes, maybe I think that's next week's reading. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, next week's next week's viewing. Sorry. All right. So most of you say the API. I'm te I tend towards the API for this reason. If I put the rules in the application, then what happens when I have a mobile applications? Like when I add mobile applications to this, mobile applications will talk directly to the API. They're not going to talk to the web application, right? Mobile applications are even crazier because mobile applications. I mean, I could put the rules in the mobile application as well. But a couple of problems. One is somebody could create a hacked version of my app on a mobile application and bypass the policies. So I can't just put it in the mobile application. I probably need it in the API anyway. Second problem with mobile applications. Not all my users are going to use the same version of my mobile applications, and I can't force them. Some people simply don't update their apps. So if I change my policies and people don't update their apps, they're still on the old policies. So I need to have it on the web API, right? So it appears that the web API might be the better place to have, um, might be a better place to have my policies. But wait, hold on. Eventually, I need my interface to also know the policies. Like, should I have the join button? Should I have a delete button? Like, the buttons shouldn't appear if people are not allowed to click them. Because that's a really bad experience if I say delete project and click delete the project, and it says, oh, sorry, you're not allowed to delete the project. The user might say, well, why did you give me a delete project button then? You know, so that's a problem. If it's on the API, how are my web, how's my interface going to know my policies then? Hey, distributed policy, distributing policies is difficult, right? Where should our policies be defined? Uh, where should the decisions be made? If you want to change the policy, how do we find it? All right. Uh, and where should we do it? The viewer, the view, the controller, the model, the services. Most of you said the model. Some of you said the controller. Most of you said the model. Some of you think maybe the service, okay? But here's the problem. It can get scattered all over the place. Maybe a new developer joins. They feel, oh, it should be in the model. It should be in the service. These security policies can get, get scattered all over the place. And that's essentially one of the big problems with security is that we have all these rules, but they're in a thousand different locations in our system. And we don't know where to check anymore. Some, there's one rule in the model, one rule in the controller, one rule in the service object, all right? So um, a, a conventional way of handling the system nowadays is not to have our rules in the model, not to have it in the controller, not to have it in the service object, rather put the rules in their own object. And we sometimes call these policy objects or rule objects, but I'm going to call them policy objects because they're about security policies. Policy objects are classes or objects which are just about policy and nothing else. They're just recording policy. And here's an example of my project policy object. So this time in my web API, that's the place I'm going to put my policies because I want one central authoritative place where all my policies are. I know I need them on the front end too, but we'll come to that problem later. I need one place for sure where I check the truth of the policy, and that has to be my API. So I have a, in my API this week, I have a whole folder full of policy objects, okay? 
So this week in my, um, this is my app. Where's my, my API? Um, I have got a whole folder full of policy objects. Okay. And what each of these is, is it's a list of policies that pertain to a particular set of rules. So let's take a look. These are Paul, this project policy are all the policies concerning the projects of our system. Okay. And it's a central place to store and execute these policies. How do we use them? They're actually very easy to use because they're plain Ruby objects with only business rules or, or, or security policies in them. Okay. So the way it works is this. Um, so I have a class called project policy and I initialize it. Like I make a new policy object by giving it, telling it which account is trying to interact with which project. Remember policies is typically about a subject and one or more objects. So I have to have these individual entities in my initializer. Okay. So initialize it by telling it which account and which project. Then, so like, for example, I can say project policy dot new account and my account can be listed the first account in my database. The project can be the first um, project in my database. Okay. Let me see if I can go do this live. Uh, so I'm in my API and my, uh, let me go into credence. So project policy dot new. Oops, excuse me. Let me just say account equals account dot first. That's some array uh, and project is equal to project dot first. That's this, that data project. Okay. So um, now I can say account, uh, excuse me, project policy dot new account project. Okay. And that returns to me a policy object. And what these objects have now are a whole bunch of functions, which we call predicates. Predicate, for those of you taking my BSES class, <laughs> is this a function? In, in, in computer science, it's thought of as a function that returns yes or no. That's it, Boolean, yes or no. Okay. In, in, in math and logic, there's another meaning to predicates. Uh, you can go click on this link here to see what predicates, where they come from in, in, in the domains of math and logic. But we borrowed the idea in computer sciences and functions or methods that just return, that just tell you yes or no are called predicates, okay? So I've got a whole bunch of predicate methods now that just tell me, can this account do a behavior on this project? So for example, can view, can this account view this project or the details of the project. It says true. And why is it true? Because here is my rule now. My rule is the account is an owner or the account is a collaborator on this project. All right. What the hell is account is owner? Account is owner is also another predicate method. These are private methods I wrote here. Account is owner simply checks if the project's owner is this account. Account is collaborator checks if the list of collaborator objects in the project includes this account. All right. So I've created some private predicates, which actually know how to look through my model objects and answer some very low level questions like account is owner, account is collaborator. That way, all these other predicates, these public predicates, they don't have to have any code that has any Ruby logic or model logic in them, okay? I've hidden all that model specific logic in these private methods. And then I use these private predicates to make really readable policy rules. Like who can view this object? Account is owner, account is collaborator. The cool thing is, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, even if you were not a programmer, if, if you were like a lawyer or a manager, you could read my policy rules because they read like English. I don't think a manager who doesn't know how to write code would know what the hell this means. And they shouldn't have to know what this means because it's programmer world, <laughs> right? So I hide all the stuff that's very programmer specific. Like what the hell is equal to equal to? Does that make like, does that make my project owner into an account? Or I mean, you don't have to know, pro so, 
to avoid them having their own programming, I've made a much simpler version of my public rules. And I hide all the technical stuff in private predicates. My public predicates are quite open. Notice some rules like, can this account edit the details of this project? The rule is the same as the can view. However, this is one of those cases where duplication is okay. Even though the code is the same, account is owner or account is collaborator, it's okay to have duplication when you're making rules because you want the rules to be clear to read, not like super efficient in how they're written. Okay, so duplication is okay when you're writing policies because they really relate to human concepts. All right. Um, can they remove this? Uh, can they delete this project? Well, only if the account is the owner of the project. Can they leave this project? Like, can an owner, uh, I'm, I'm the, this account, Somia Ray, owns this data project. Can Somia leave the project? It says, no, you can't leave the project. You're the owner of the project. So you have to stick around for this project. All right. Um, can they add documents? Can they remove documents? Can they add collaborators? Can they remove collaborators? Policy objects. They're easy to find because they're in a directory called policies. <laughs> if someone says, hey, what are your security policies? I say, just go look at my policies folder. It's all there, all right? There's one place where all my policy objects are. Are they easy to read? You can make them easy to read by just removing, uh, just by hiding the lower level predicates that actually do some specific Ruby-ish code, okay? So to me, anything other than Boolean operators, anything other than or, and, or some very simple conditional logic should not be in the um, public predicates. They should be in private predicates. And make the public predicates as readable as possible to non-programmers if possible, okay? Are they easy to change? Yeah, they're easy to change, right? They're super easy to change. Let's say we wanted to change the policy so that nobody's allowed to delete any projects. Just go find this method and make it false. Now nobody can delete the project. <laughs> easy, right? So they're super easy to change. And you don't have to go find them in a, which you don't have to ask yourself, oh, which model is it in? Which controller is it in? How is it written? I don't understand this Ruby code. Easy to read, easy to change. And also brilliantly, these policies are easy to test. You don't have to test the whole system to know if your policies are doing the right thing. You can write a whole bunch of scenarios in your tests and just test the policy object is doing what it's supposed to do. All right. So they're very easy to test as well. So this is the idea of policy objects and they solve a lot of the problems we have talked about before. Where should they go uh, in our system? Right. So now policy objects are not spread all over our system. They are only present in our API. And within our API, they're only present in a folder called policies. And each policy rule has its own, each set of rules has its own name. Like, I've got policies now on, uh, on uh, let's say on accounts. Like, who can view an account? who can edit an account, who can delete an account, okay? Self-request just means, is it the same person asking for this account? Is it yourself, okay? Collaboration request policy. This is who is allowed, like if I have a project and somebody requests to add another account as a collaborator, right? Who, who can invite? So I have rules that make sure that the requester is allowed to add collaborators and that the account they're trying to add is allowed to be a collaborator. Otherwise, don't even send an invitation, all right? So this is all about who's even allowed to invite people, all right? So I've got all these kind of like different rules now in my system. My document has a whole bunch of things, like who can view a document, edit a document, delete a document, all right? And I showed you project policies before. Policy objects. Any questions on policy objects? I think they're a very, yeah, okay, uh, Riley, go ahead.
Yeah. Models. Mod yes, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, let me try to address that question. So Riley's got a great question and it relates because she's seen my other class where we deal with business rules oh, the whole semester long. Um, and her question is generally we create entire domain models to handle business logic and this looks like business logic. Well, um, it's true. The difference between this and domain models, Riley, is that these are rules that relate to multiple domain objects, okay? So they're relating multiple domain objects together, so we make their own object out of them, okay? Otherwise, if this was only about like a single thing, we could also make it in, we could also make these rules inside uh, domain models as well, all right? That's one answer I'm going to give you, is that if there's multiple objects and you need to figure out a complicated rule between all the objects, then it's nice to have an object just for this rule or this policy by itself, okay? Not to stick it within a, a model of another entity, of a specific entity. A second thing, though, it's also sometimes nice, or really nice, I think, to put your security rules separate from your other domain rules, okay? So other domain rules are things like how do, if I have an e-commerce website, how do I calculate the discount on the shopping cart? That's a domain rule. And that should maybe go in a shopping cart model, domain model, okay? But these are security rules. So I would, I would even say make security rules separate from your domain rules. And maybe you could even call it security policies if you want, okay? Because they're very specific and they're very different. And they're not so much about how do you calculate something they're more about authorization. What are you allowed to do? So that's one thing I would deviate from the SOA class is to say security policies, which are about authorization, should possibly really be in a folder by themselves. Maybe called policies or authorization policies or security policies or something like that. Okay. Great question. Fantastic question. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on policy objects? So I'm a big fan of this kind of objects. And by the way, to me, one thing I like about the Ruby language is that everything we've done this semester can be done in any language. But Ruby is one of the few languages where you can make human rules look really readable <laughs> because of simple things like putting a little question mark at the end, okay? Um, most of the other technical stuff looks the same in any language, pretty much, okay? This is one of the few places where Ruby really shines is when you look at policy objects, domain objects, things like that, All right? Okay, moving on. All right, um, so how do I use them then? So now, whenever I'm in, in all my controllers now, I use my policy objects before I do something. So for example, somebody wants to see up details of a project, they go to this route, API v1 slash projects and the ID of that project. Well, I find the account who's asking from my authorization token. I find the project that they're trying to find. Okay, if, if, the, if they have, if both are not available for some reason, of course I say not found. But if I do have an account in a project, then in my controller, I ask my policy object can this account view this project? And if they can't, unauthorized, done, okay? Now my controller does implement this logic, but I don't have this complicated if this or that rule in my controller. My controller doesn't have to be busy with like conditional logic. It's very simply saying unauthorized error unless my policy objects say I can continue, okay? And if the policy objects are fine, then go ahead, show all the details and make a JSON, return it, whatever you want, all right? So now in your controllers is a great place before you even go to your service objects, I would say. I would say you can do it in your service objects, but I think even in your controllers, as soon as possible, um, make sure that you're allowed to do the things you're about to be asked to do. You could do it in your service object, but um, it's fine if you want to do it in your service object. But I really like to do it right away, as soon as possible. As soon as I have the entities, the subject and the object, 
entities, I like to check the policy right away, okay, before I get started with any service policy or whatever you have. Okay, cool. And now my controllers are very clean again because they can mo my controller can focus mostly on controller stuff like you know the routing, JSON, status codes, other things. Okay, and the other stuff looks is very short and clean. All right. Scopes. So remember when I uh, go to um, see my projects, I go to this projects tab. It shows me a list of all my projects. Well, how do I know what projects to list? One thing I could do is I could first get a list of all the projects and then go project by project, iterate through all the projects and apply a rule to say, is this project listable? Is this project listable? Is this project listable? That's okay, that's one way to do it, but I think it's a slightly inefficient way to do it. A nicer way to potentially do it is whenever you have an aggregate a list of objects that you need to apply rules to, is to write your own code, um, and we call these security policy scopes, which basically only get the objects that are a rule is applicable to. So for example, if you want to list all the projects on screen, then I have within my project policy class, I have a subclass called account scope. And in account scope, I basically say, uh, what's the current account? And what is the uh, uh, target account? And I have a list here called viewable, a, 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 variable, a method here called viewable, which actually returns all the projects that are viewable for this current, um, uh, by this current account, okay? So I start with the full scope, which means I get all the projects that belong to this target account. That's my full scope, okay? And then viewable says, if the current account is the target account, just return the full scope, means return all the projects uh, of that target account. But if the current account is not the account whose project I'm trying to view proje uh, projects of, then just select the projects in which the current account is a collaborator. All right. So essentially, an account a scope class gives me a list of objects following certain rules. And these rules might be slightly different than these rules here. Okay, it might be slightly different than these rules here. All right. So there's often you often need unique logic to produce a list of objects so that goes in my account scope object and i've tried maybe i've not done a great job i could make it better i think but i've tried to make it somewhat readable but i think i could make it more readable still all right so now let's say i have two accounts like account two is a current account account one is the target account and let's say account two the current account wants to see all the projects of the target accounts which projects can they see? Like, let's say I want, let's say there's another user on my system called Furen, and I want to go see Furen's projects. Can I see a list of all of Furen's projects? Well, what I would do this time is I would say, oh, there's a little typo here. This should say project policy account scope, not scope. So it should say project policy account scope, and I say this current account wants to see the projects of this account. Please show me all the viewable projects. Okay. And so this is one way in which you can kind of have a class which specifically gets lists of objects, okay? Not just one, it doesn't just tell you the policy of one object, it doesn't just say yes or no, it actually returns to you aggregations of objects based on a certain policy rule, okay? All of this, again, still within my project policy. Okay. And the place I use that is in my um, controller, to get all the projects, so API v1 projects, this gets a list of all the projects from my API. And here I basically say, you know, I use this account scope to get all the, all the projects this current account is allowed to see of the account whose token was returned. And here's again where tokens become really important. Remember, I, I could here potentially use somebody else's token. So I have, a, I have somebody who's logged in but they're gonna, but they're presenting the token of somebody else, 
and they're saying, I want to see this person's projects. That's fine. Uh, one user is allowed to see another user's projects. That's totally fine. But then give me the token that belongs to that other user. And what I'll do is I will just show you the projects that you are allowed to see of that other user using this scope object, right? So scope objects allow you to now kind of have logic about how different subjects can view aggregations of objects within each other, right? So policy rule objects and scope objects, all part of policy objects, all right? So if you're only going to return a yes or no, use a policy object. If you need to get a list of resources following a certain policy, create a specific scope object that returns that list to you with the policy rules written within it. Okay, Because once again, you don't want some logic like this hidden away in some controller somewhere because you, you won't know where it is. So now the nice thing is my controller, which shows the listing of projects, it can use a scope object to kind of get the list of all the viewable objects. All right. Cool. So these are policy objects. Really nice, right? So policy rules, or I should say policy rule objects and policy scope objects. Okay. One gives you predicates, Boolean, yes or no, can do, cannot do. The other actually returns you a list of resources following certain rules. All right. And this makes your code clean, and it solves a lot of these problems around distributing policies. Keep it in one place and have a standard set of rules. You can always go to it and kind of fix it. And what's really nice is if later somebody comes to you and says, are we following these, this human, this legal document correctly? Well, we can now sit side by side. A manager or a lawyer and a programmer can sit side by side and compare this document to this document. And hopefully say, yes, we're following the rules or no, we're not following the rules. They're both looking at documents in their respective languages, a legal document or a um, technical policy documents. Okay. So this also kind of, you know, answers the question of how do you translate formal legal policies into technical policies? And um, this is my suggestion to you for every policy document, make sure you have a corresponding technical document that follows, that, that specifies the rules and your code has to follow those rules, okay? Nice. Okay, what else? One more problem. You'll notice, like, let me go here. That, uh, I'm Somia Ray on this website, okay? I'm Somia Ray. Let me zoom in a little bit. And uh, when I go into data project, I show me array owns data project and I've got a couple of files in here and um, I can go into one of these files and uh, if I want to see the document, I just click on show document is a description of the document. Here's the secret documents. Okay. Quote unquote secret documents. So I've got all these files with some secrets in it and I can now go in and take a look and see what these are. Okay. This is obviously my development database. This is just seed data, not actual data. Okay, don't get too excited. I'm, you know my tokens. You also note here, I've got a list of collaborators on the side. Nice, huh? Okay, and uh, I can add collaborators by adding their email and this will add the collaborator if I'm allowed to add them as a collaborator. I can also delete these collaborators. Like I can delete Furan or Galit as from collaborating on this project. Okay, now, what if I was Furen and not Somia? Let's do that. Let's log out. Let me log back in this time as Furen. Okay. So when I go to look at the projects, Furen should have a list of projects as well. And Furen is also a data project because Furen is a collaborator on the data project. Okay. So Furen can see this data project from their scope. But you'll notice Furen cannot delete any collaborators, not allowed to delete the collaborators. But Furen can leave the project if, if he wants, all right? And can edit the project and add new documents. Back to Somia. All right, back to Somia. And here, 
I can go ahead and um, I can remove collaborators and things. Notice I don't have a leave project button because I'm the owner. I can't leave the project, but I can delete the project. That's a link that collaborators did not have. They could not delete projects. Okay. How does my interface know all my rules? Because my rules are far, far away in the API. How does my interface know the rules? Right? So where do we do that? Do I, what should I do? Should I rewrite the rules in the application controller? Should I rewrite the rules in my view or my interface or in my JavaScript? Like, I mean, what do I do? Because this is confusing. Should I just duplicate all my rules? so that my front-end developers can also use those rules? Because it'll be a very bad experience if I have back-end rules and the front-end interface is not related to it. That would be really terrible, right? Like, um, I have all these buttons and things and you cannot do half of them. <laughs> it would look ridiculous. So, um, where and when does, how does the interface get to know our rules? Any thoughts about what to do? How many of you feel we should rewrite the rules in JavaScript on the front end? Just raise your hand. Nobody? Oh, I, let's see if there's any comments coming in. <laughs> Riley says, look at the next page. Ah, oh, yes, that's exactly what you should do. <laughs> when in doubt in life, just go to the next slide, okay? Just, just a life hack, okay? <laughs> okay. How many of you think you should rewrite the rules in the applic web application, and then in the controller, you can tell the browser what to do? Nobody. Okay, fine. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a solution that I think is elegant. It's not super dynamic, but it works quite nicely. Our API knows our policy rules and our policy scopes, right? What we can do is we can ask the API, not for every single rule. So one tempting thing to do is to have like a, like 10 or 20 more controller routes in the API for each and every single rule. Oh my God, that would be a nightmare, okay? Like if you have like, <laughs> for every every little rule, you have another controller route. That'll, I mean, you could do that, but it's just, oh, I, I'm just crying thinking about it, okay? What you could do though, is you could return a summary of all your rules as a JSON object. And that summary could be passed around from your API to your application, from your application to your browser, okay? Let's take a look at what some policy summaries look like. So now, in each of my policy objects, excuse me, let me just change the color scheme here to like, um, oh, 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 okay, hold on. My color scheme is changing, okay? So if I look at my project policy now, so these are all my rules. And at the end of all my rules, my public rules, I have one last method, public method called summary. What summary does is it runs all my rules and it makes a big hash out of it. It literally runs the can view method and it makes a hash with can view, can edit, can delete, can leave with the same name. I don't put a question mark in it because I don't know if in JSON you can have question marks in the keys. I don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't know. So I just kind of like do it like this. Okay. And what's cool now is I can call a policy object. All right. Oh, excuse me. I can call a policy object with an, you know, initialize it. And instead of asking it a specific rule, I can ask for a summary. Why, Why is it going to the next page? And that will return to me a hash with the answer to all my rules. All right. And I can pass this, I can return this along with, like, for example, anytime anyone asks my API for a project, 
they have to give me an account and a project and they can ask my API to get to see this project with this account using the, you know, the, the authorization token to find the account. What I can do is that I can not only return to them all the details of the project, I can also merge in, in Ruby adds more values to a hash. So full details returns the full details of the project as a hash and I'm going to add to it all my a summary of all my policies. So this is also in my JSON. So when somebody asks, hey, give me the details of a project, I not only tell them, okay, here's the name of the project, the URL of the project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I will also give it as part of that hash, a little summary hash telling it, by the way, the, the auth token that you provided me, if you use that auth token, here are all the permissions you have. You can view it, edit it, delete it. You can't leave it, but you can add da 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 da. All right. So now what happens is that my web application, when it asks my web API, hey, get, uh, get me the details of a project. My web API returns, here's the project, here are the attributes, the ID, the name, the owner, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some relationships, the owners, the collaborators, so da, da, da. And then as part of that object, it also returns the policies. It says, by the way, the auth token you gave me, these are your permissions. These are the other things you're allowed to do, okay? Now my web application can be intelligent. It knows which policies it can, what things it can ask for, what things it cannot ask for, all right? So that's one nice thing. My web application now knows the policies when it asks for a resource. It gets the resource attributes and it also gets the resource policies, all right? So that's how you transfer policies from your API to other actors, all right? And then my API, it cannot run any methods, but it can examine the, um, you'll see what it does here is um, once I get these uh, in my API, I've got a project model, which kind of unparses all the stuff that's coming at it. Excuse me, that unparses all the stuff coming at it. So let me, let me go to my uh, API. So my API also has models. I introduced them last week. My API also has models. All right. Excuse me. Okay. Let me lower this. So my API can get the project info. Uh, my, my web application can get the project info from an API and it hashes and, and it kind of parses through all them. It goes through all them. It creates accounts, creates the relationships. It kind of recreates all those things. And then part of it is it opens up the policies and it puts it into an open struct object. Open struct is a very special object in Ruby. Um, what open struct does in Ruby, let me see if I can just demo it really quickly. With open struct, and I'm just going to call this OS, okay? And um, You can give OpenStruct a hash of some kind, like let's say like, you know, names. Ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just give me a second here. Wow. Streaming everything is my computer super slow or maybe there's something else going on. I really got to check why my computer is so slow right now. So um, I can now use OpenStruct to do the following. So Let's say OS is equal to open struct dot new. I can pass open struct um, a, uh, let's say name, Somia, um, and, uh, you know, email, Somia dot Ray at Gmail. Okay. What open struct does is it takes a hash and it makes it to an object. So I could ask OS, I could treat it like a hash and say, what's the name? OpenStruct also allows me to treat the hash as if the, as if the keys are strings. 
but it also allows me to treat it like an object and say, what's the name? Okay, that's a little trick of OpenStruct. It, allows, it converts hashes into something that behaves like an object. Okay, so what I do is I convert all my policies into an OpenStruct. Now I can ask policies that can view, can edit, can delete, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now in the controller of my, uh, excuse me, in the view, in the view of my web application. When I get this project model class, I can do things like you see all this button, like add a new file, add a new document, add a collaborator, edit a project, delete a project. I can say if project policy says that I can add a document, then go ahead, show that button. If the project policy says I can remove collaborators, then go ahead, you know add that button with a link or, or this little X symbol to delete, uh, to remove collaborators. Add this little X symbol so I can delete collaborators. All right. Similarly, when I make at the bottom, when I'm making these links, I can say if the project policy says I can edit or I can delete or I can leave, then show the appropriate links. All right. So essentially the trick that we have done is we're returning the project policies as a JSON object to the application. The application or the view could use these JSON policies to make decisions for itself. It doesn't have to keep going to the API every time to, to know the rules, okay? You could even pass these JSON object of policies to the JavaScript for the front end. So the front end JavaScript could also have these policy, know these policies so it can dynamically change the website in any way, the web page in any way that it wants, all right? So these are, the, this is how we can resolve the problem about um, client-side policy. How does your web application or your browser get to know what policies they are? Don't duplicate your policy logic, whatever you do. Just pass a summary along as a JSON object and let them use it as such, all right? Wow. Cool. So yes, as I mentioned this week, in my web application, I also have models as I did last week. And by and large, they are just parsing data. Okay. By the way, a couple of changes I've made that you should notice. For example, the project model in my web application is just parsing the model, the model data coming from the API, but it's also kind of like handling the uh, policies and stuff. Okay. Um, one more thing, sorry. Um, this week I've renamed my current account object into just account. And the reason is I can use this account object not only for the current account, the person logged in, I can reuse it to parse the data for any other account whose information I have. For example, in the project model, all the collaborators are going to be an array of accounts. So I have kind of changed the uh, current account object that I class that I had last week, and I just called it account. And it still has the logged in, logged out methods that we had last week, but now it also has methods to kind of um, parse out the username, parse out the email from what's coming back from the API. All right. Okay, let me see if there's any questions here. So Riley says, uh, uh, Yenyu says, smart solution. Thank you, Yenyu. That's why I get paid the big money to do this, okay? Um, Riley says, I like the solution. I'm also wondering that if there's any other way to do it. Did I answer your question, Riley? Right. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, uh, there is another way. There is another way. Um, you could take your policy objects and package them like a gem in Ruby. 
and then your web application and your web API could import the same gem or the same package. And if you keep it up to date, then they will know the same policy rule. That's possibly another way to do it is you could package your um, rules as a like quote unquote package. All right. And, um, and uh, so uh, that's if you don't want to use summaries, you really want to have the dynamic objects around, then you can do that, okay? Because there might be some rules which are so dynamic that you can't really summarize them because you need to have like more information, you know, like you really want to query them in a more powerful way. Then you may need to package your policy objects as, as uh, Ruby packages, Python packages, JavaScript package, whatever it is, and then different applications can like import that gem, okay? But you have to be then careful that every time you change the policies that you go through all the systems that are using that gem or package and they get the latest version. So that's not easy to do. I mean, you have to really, you have to really coordinate very well between all the teams working on your system, okay? So the summaries, I think, is a nice way to do it and you don't need any coordination between the different teams. Maybe there's one team working on the web application, another team working on the web API, another team working on a mobile application. And with summaries, you don't need to talk, they don't need to consult each other about the change in policies because the API will just return summaries all the time. All right, so, but, so depending on how much coordination you have, you can have a different type of solution like this. All right, yeah, good question. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Any other questions? So that kind of resolves most of the issues for today. So what have we done this week? We've added authorization, but in two forms. One is actually validation, not technically authorization, but we're using form objects, um, limiting what we can do with Unicode, especially for usernames and checking password entropy and stuff like that. But all of this is done through form objects. So I do ask you this week, to add validation to all your front end forms on the web application so that you're ensuring that you're only getting like correct input. All right. And then on the back end on the API, add security policies, which means policy objects with rules and predicates, um, with rules as predicates, and scope objects, which kind of give you not yes or no answers, but give you an entire list of objects if you ask it it'll apply your rules to kind of get certain set of objects, okay? And then implement summaries that you can return to your web application on the front end so that your front end developers, your web application or JavaScript developers for the browser developers, for uh, front end designers and other people can all use your policies. It shouldn't be just something the API only knows, right? And this ensures that policies are kind of translated from back to front. Cool. So we're like now more than halfway. We've covered most of the topics in, in authorization uh, this week. So last week we did token-based authorization and we saw bearer tokens. And this week we see security policies as another, for, as another aspect of authorization. And what's really cool is this is really, the way we've done it is really the way businesses and enterprises should be doing policies, okay? And this is why I again warned that like if you're making an enterprise system, a business application, um, a lot of companies are like, let's just hire a, a, like a CS undergrad and they can just make everything. You really have to craft these things carefully to make it future proof. And concepts like security policies are really, I don't think you learn them anywhere other than a business school. But this is a really business way of thinking about policies more formally. All right. Cool. Look at this slide. Oh my God. Like, do you remember when the semester began? These were all empty and we were like, what are we going to do with all these dimensions of security? We've covered a lot of stuff. We've really covered a lot of stuff and done, a, I, I think uh, we've learned a lot of things that maybe you knew some of this, but I doubt you knew these things to this level of detail. All right. So we're, we're pretty amazing. We still got two more lectures to go. Um, and they're both about authorization technically. Next week will be about um, other protocols and authorization and authentication. We'll talk about that next week. In particular, we'll look at the OAuth protocol, which is very popular. There's other protocols I'd also like to look at, but we don't have time this semester. And 
I think we've all done a lot, so I'm not going to really cover them. I mean, I might mention them, but we'll look at some other well-known protocols to coordinate authentication and authorization between systems, okay? Like, for example, what if somebody came to you tomorrow and said, listen, I love it. I'd like to integrate your system with my system. How do you, like, how are you going to do that? Like, you remember, like, when you use SendGrid or Mailgun, but now we're using SendGrid? Uh, we have, they, they provide us an API token. Are you going to provide an API token? How do you make an API token? Like, you know, like we'll cover that kind of stuff next week. All right. Um, what else are we going to cover? So that's going to be next week. We'll talk about some protocols about distributed authentication or authorization. And then week 17, we'll talk about the browser. How do we do, how do we, we, how do we enforce the browser to be more secure? Because a lot of hacks can come in through the browser or the browser can get hacked by other people. So we'll really talk about browser side policies and we'll talk about like, how do we, like what policies do we have about what the browser can and cannot do? And you'll be, many of you, not all of you, but many of you will be surprised to know that browsers have a lot of policies built into them and you can turn those policy rules on or off. And we'll talk about how to toggle the policies of what the browser can and cannot do, okay? So you can actually control the user's browser and what it can and cannot do. We'll talk about that in week 17, okay? So just a little uh, timeline. Um, I think the most difficult class of the semester, I think, in terms of coding was last week. The registration tokens, the authorization tokens is difficult, okay? And to get that to work through all your system is, it'll take a little bit of doing. This week's stuff, I don't think it's that difficult. It's actually quite fun to write and kind of fun to see it all put together, though it is a lot of work, okay? Next week will be quite a bit of work as well. We will implement OAuth and one or two protocols. Okay, it's it's not difficult. It's just more technical work. Week seventeen is the last week before your presentations. I will show you the browser side policy stuff, but the implementation will be super easy. You literally have to copy paste two files, two or three files, and you're done. There'll be very little for you to do, like new. You just have to like literally copy paste a couple of files I'll provide you. Just understand what they are, copy paste it, and you're done. And you can spend the rest of the time on week 17 getting your final presentation working and up to speed and working on your um, working on the actual uh, present if the presentation and stuff like that. Okay. So the week 17 implementation will be very very simple, uh, and you can spend most of your time getting your application to work and getting your presentation set up for the last week. Okay. Uh, before we sign off, I'll just take any last questions that we have. All right. Smiley faces all around. Okay. In that case, thank you, everybody. This has been uh, a privilege and an honor to share uh, how to do authorization with you. We'll come back. We'll do a couple more weeks of authorization and policies. And uh, we're wrapping up and uh, becoming strong, secure developers. So excited to see what this all turns into on week 18. Okay. All right, cool. Um, if if that's if uh, that's everything.